नमस्कार ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ नेमी निधि एंड नटरंग प्रतिष्ठान वी आर वेरी हैप्पी टू वेलकम यू ऑल दिस इवनिंग फॉर द ट्वेल्थ नेमी चंद्र जैन मेमोरियल लेक्चर प्रोफेसर शामिक बंदोपाध्याय वुड बी टॉकिंग टू अस ऑन द थीम टू वर्ड्स अ हिस्ट्रियोग्राफी ऑफ इंडियन थिएटर मे आई इन्वाइट शामिक बंदोपाध्याय आई स्टार्ट विथ a piece of writing by nemiji writing in 1983 she wrote he wrote something uncomfortable unpleasant but in his typical manner the truth is that in spite of some restless energy often expressed only quantitatively in proliferation of groups and the number of plays staged the delhi theater basically remains elitist dominated and patronized by and catering to the tastes and requirements of the westernized officialdom or the english oriented intelligentsia from where to almost all its directors actors critics come the performances though in hindi don't quite reflect the manners gestures movements and general behavior of ordinary hindi speaking people and the stage speech in these shows lacks the color the tonal quality the rhythm and the music of the spoken language apart from the usual faulty pronunciation and anglicized accents which all make it difficult for the spectators to identify with them it is not an accident that in marathi or bengali even the foreign plays appear and sound related to the life of the people now he was making a very very foundational point when he said it a theater has so much to do with the body it is the body expressing itself through theater the entire body the total body the physical body the vocal body bodies in conjunction they all come into play totally in the experience of the theater and as long as the body remains an object stuck in the framework of the stage and cut off from the cultural space of the body the body is a dead mechanical body a body without a life of its own this entire question of the body out there beyond the stage and the body on stage interacting as bodies not in verbalizations vocalizations gestures but a body in a culture a body that grows and defines and identifies itself in a culture in a total culture it's the culture that speaks through the body that embeds the body that wraps the body that breathes through the body the culture is a whole it is that what nemi ji found lacking in delhi not for any fault of the people engaged in the theater here but in the fact of its culture as it has been defined historically the delhi of the 1950s 60s 70s was a delhi of officialdom the western model of theater as theater per se for the whole of the country nobody had given it much thought why where when not taking into account the fact the reality the historical reality that in the long tradition of performance in india there had never been 
this clear distinction between music, dance, theatre, other marginal, different kinds of performances. A wide range of performances. Some of them couldn't be put into a strict category of theatre or music or dance. This entire range that remained and that had been marginalized and marginalized historically as part of the colonial agenda, the pre-national agenda, when back in 1853, Lord Thomas Babington Macaulay, no great reactionary, no demon as such, a highly sophisticated historian, scholar, a very sensitive reader of British literature, a brilliant, sensitive interpreter of English romantic literature. In a minute in education, dated 2nd February 1853, Macaulay wrote, we must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern. A class of persons, Indian in blood and color, but English in tastes, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. To that class, we may leave it to refine the vernacular dialects of the country to enrich those dialects with terms of science borrowed from the Western nomenclature and to render them by degrees fit for conveying knowledge to the great mass of the population. And as this agenda was officially adopted by the colonial government, there was a conscious attempt in which they succeeded fairly well with the Western educated intelligentsia who were only Indian in blood and color, but English in tastes and opinions and morals and in intellect, to reject the entire indigenous, natural, national cultures of India. It was important for the colonial administration to create this class a class of agents, a class of compradors, a class of exploiters working on behalf of the colonial masters, they had to be so strongly alienated from the people of the country culturally that they would feel no compunction when it came to exploiting these people and taking away whatever they had for enriching the colonial project. It was important to create this cultural alienation. They would remain Indian in blood and color, but they would lose their Indian bodies, their cultural bodies. This was important. So there was a conscious effacement, a conscious erasure of the cultural history of the people. Without any support, with the new landed aristocracy moving into the cities, the old patronage systems, the old support systems for the local cultures, they got disintegrated, totally dismantled. And this continued for nearly 200 years. So all the traces of the local cultures around the metropolises, these had been successfully erased out of existence. And only those territories, those locations, where the long arm of the colonial rulers had not extended, only there the local cultures survived. And the community somehow supported them, 
nourish them, nurture them. So they had to be discovered far away from the three metropolises, the centres of colonial power in India. So that whole mode of performance, that culture of Indian performance, which did not have this sharp divide between theatre, dance, music. And even if you come to think of it, this division, even in the European experience, was barely from the 18th century. It's only post-enlightenment. When with the Enlightenment project, the project of scientizing knowledge, you have to categorize, you have to break it up and create separate modules, separate sectors. It's only then that they become divided up. So that entire performance continuity of dance, even acrobatics, martial, not arts, but martial practices, martial crafts of living. The word martial arts, I find almost sinister. These were not arts. These were live practices. And we safely categorize them when we come into this grids of the Enlightenment brand, of the Enlightenment protocol. They become martial arts to be studied in isolation and studied for its techniques alone. Things that we can lift and use in our modern theater as usable materials. So this whole history was lost to us as we concentrated on a strange phenomenon called theater. Even when you think of the Western, so-called Western theater that came our way, keep in mind the simple fact that in the 18th century, in the early 18th century for the first time, a British actor called David Garrick buys 50% of the property of the theater called Jury Lane Theater. And the whole institution of the actor manager comes into being. And with the institutionalization of the actor manager, you have the beginning of stardom. The star who stands above and beyond the performance. The star reinvents himself as a commodity, as an investment. The actor is not playing. The actor is performing as a commodity. He has invested his actorial skill and his reputation is standing as an actor, his popularity as an actor, and that is what he plays with, not with the performance. As we start entering this scenario in the 60s, as we started entering it, it was an extremely problematic situation. The local cultures were coming into their own slowly and defining themselves, rejecting some of the colonial baggage, but holding on to a lot of that continuously. New theatres were coming into being, but new theatres still truncated, controlled, checked at various levels. And the one complaint that has been almost universal in all the metropolises in India since the 60s has been, we don't have a proper audience. Who supports us? The state should be supporting us more and then we can survive. We never have really enthusiastic audiences, large audiences coming our way. That has been the perennial problem. Now, one of the serious problems 
that the metropolitan theatres face, particularly in Bengal and in other parts, not so much in Bombay. Bombay was an exception. I'll get into that story briefly. Theatre didn't travel so much. Theatre got stuck. And by the 1930s, late 1920s and 1930s, in Bengal and in several other places, we had the revolving disc on the theatre. We had gimmickry with lighting. And the more these came into play, traveling became impossible. You couldn't travel because you didn't have the technology to travel. So they got stuck in the theaters. And in the process, they lost out. In Bengal, there was another problem. In the 1920s and 1930s, periods of terrorist insurgency in different parts of Bengal. So it was difficult for theater companies to travel from Calcutta to any of the districts. This is a theater which doesn't fall into the pattern into which we were growing, which we were accepting as our models. But this remained there. I'm trying to open up, open up a discourse where if we could go back to these theaters, study them with reverence, with respect, spend some time there, not workshopping for a week or 15 days and pick up something. Uh, somehow, even the activists, even those who try to question and critique the colonial package, the colonial history, and try to reconstruct a history, build a new history, and a new historiography, write a new history for Indian theater. Even they trip up at one point and fall into the trap where even an Indian theater worker trying to get out of the colonial bindings falls into the same trap and would like to pick up some of the martial arts or techniques and practices and use them. And in a way at one point, and with that I close. Uh, isn't the state carrying out, following out still, McCauley's agenda in a way, creating, just change a few words here and there. The state still wants a class of persons, Indian in blood and color, but instead of the word English, bring in the word global, in tastes, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. And to that class of globalized Indians, still Indians in blood and color, we may leave it to reform the vernacular dialects of the country those local cultures, styles, they're just dialects, local, regional dialects of the country, to enrich those dialects with terms of science. You can add IT to that. Borrowed from, instead of Western, the global nomenclature, and to render them by degrees fit for conveying knowledge to the great mass of the population. So the state, the great mass of the population, they remain as distant as ever, each from the other, and in between this different kind of culture, a culture without a body that we create and nurture and support. So the Macaulay agenda continues. So I'm trying in my humble way and in a, in a kind of uh, scratching, uh, scampering kind of manner, not in a very well-organized manner, 
not in an academic manner as such, to go back into a lot of the literature, in my case, the one language, the one culture that I know, the Bangla culture. I write in both the languages, Bangla and English. I write more in Bangla. I speak more in Bangla. And so it, I, I take pride in that, my place in that culture, my location in that culture. So I'm trying to read up literature, mainly balladic, narrative literature, which was, according to the records, usually sung or recited and performed. So no sharp distinction between theater verbal, dance, performative through the body, or music through the tone, but all crisscrossing and coming together. In the performance, in the presentation of these texts, and what are these texts about? These are mostly about local deities constructed by the common people. And these local deities, these gods and goddesses, mostly goddesses, rarely gods, who try to get a place and claim their place in the larger Hindu pantheon. And how they fight for that how they twist and turn and persecute the merchants, the traders, the Brahmins, the priests to get their place in the pantheon. And the people are with them because they are goddesses created, projected, produced by the people. The goddess that gives them protection from snake bite, the goddess who gives them protection from cholera and smallpox, so there are their gods and goddesses and their gods and goddesses fighting against the gods and goddesses of the upper castes, the powerful, the wealthy, the effluent. So as they tell these stories, and these are not plain narratives, these are narratives that are shared in a performative space through singing, dancing, music, performance, standing up and performing pieces, all that. This whole new, a different performance culture is in the making all the time, churning all the time. And interestingly enough, these are part of an oral tradition which came to be written in Portis, palm leaf manuscripts, as late as the 16th, 17th centuries for the first time. Till then, they were just orally circulating. And as late as 1911, when the Calcutta University for the first time opened a department for modern Indian languages, that there was a concerted effort, an organized effort, to gather these potis from different personal collections or temples or wherever they were, bring them to the university, to the academy, and collate them, study them, and produce authoritative, authorized texts with annotations, explanations. The language had changed. So it is not really an enormous body of literature as such. And I think if I get my two years or three years, I can read all of that up, the entire body of work and try to take, bring out from there the traces of old performance because they are describing their entire way of life, everything that happens in their life and in their dealings with these deities that they are projecting and creating. And through that, if I can tease out a pre-colonial history of that seamless continuity of performance that embraces theater, music, dance, martial arts, jugglery, rituals, all kinds of practices, a total performance. And maybe the vision of total theater that Nemiji and I and several others of us faced, addressed for the first time, 
back in 1966. My mind goes back to those days, to Nemiji, and once again, I'd have loved to talk all of these things over with Nemiji. Thank you.